the heat burns. Um, he has been here before. Actually, it should be turns out that the four times that he has been in India has always been in Bangalore, I guess, right? Uh, no, I have one trip to India when I did not visit Bangalore. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, last time also we gave a serious lecture, so this time we are having this discussion meeting this week. All of you have been informed. So, it's about the geodesic uh, dynamics and rigidity. So, Pete will give us even seven lectures, and the schedule is there. And it also has two lectures by Kinshan Vishwas. And that's a program. And Pete. Okay, well, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Aravinda for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to come back to Bangalore. And um, I should also thank um, the source of the money that is financing this um, event. Um, I'm afraid I don't remember, or well, maybe I've never been told exactly the name of it, so perhaps you could say a, a word about our, our sponsor. Sponsor? It's TFR Centre. It's TFR for sponsor. But you, you, you had some sort of grant that was being used. That's for this. right. That's right. Uh, yeah. So we had. Uh, yeah, it's a part of the TIFR thing called the Compact Course. Uh, so the idea is that each year we have uh, one or two, you know, distinguished visitors who will give a series of lectures, and um, it's a kind of a meeting for advanced kind of thing, in the sense of you know, graduate students and the postdocs. And uh, so we have this uh, so part of that project. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So as um, Arvin just said, this is not the first time I've been in Bangalore. In fact, the first time I came here, I was 12 years old. Um, that was in 1969, in January. Um, my father actually came here. And he was an applied mathematician, and uh, he gave a lecture in Bangalore. So I have a few memories of um, Bangalore and my saw from back then. And then I've been back to, a, well, there was a satellite conference, the ICDM, and 2010, and I was also back the year after that. Um, so what I want to talk about during this week is uh, geodesic flow and the dynamics of the geodesic flow. And um, so when you have the curvature. Um, this turns out to be, it's been one of the motivating examples in dynamical systems. And it's basically the original example of uh, what's known as hyperbolic dynamics. And so today I want to say some fairly simple things about the geodesic flow, the simplest example of it. And then I will discuss, give. Um, I've discussed an analogous example, which is technically simpler, but has many of the main ideas in it. And then in the later lectures, I'll go into some of the geometric background. And then there are, in today's argument, there is going to be one step that is very easy today. And in all of the later applications, the argument is actually the hard step. And so a lot of the week will be devoted to talking about how that is. Um, so hopefully today things will be easy, and but hopefully they won't be too difficult later on either. So um, I guess during this course, Ian will usually be a manifold, um, usually compact. But not always. So for quite a lot of things to that, well, for some things, compactness matters. For other things, it obviously doesn't. And for some things, it does matter, but it's not so obvious that it matters. Uh, we'll see. And um, <coughs> usually this manifold is Romanian. And if I want to explicitly mention the Romanian metric, I'll denote that by G. So if I really want to be careful, I'll have the pair in comma G, but usually M will be understood to come 
for the Riemannian metric. Okay, so the point of the Riemannian metric is that it gives us geometry. If we have two vectors, V and W, uh, we can form the inner product. So that gives us lengths of vectors. It gives us angles between vectors. And once you have angles between vectors, you have angles between curves. You can define the length of the curve by well, a smooth curve by integrating the length of its tangent vector. And so that gives rise to the notion of the geodesic. So roughly speaking, this is a curve that minimizes length. Uh, well, you have to be a little careful with that definition. So if you have, if I have a short enough, if I have a curve, well, if I have a short enough curve, and it's the shortest curve between its two endpoints, then it is a geodesic. And if I have a longer curve, it may not be the shortest curve between its two endpoints, um, but it can still be a geodesic. So, so a geodesic is a curve that minimizes length uh, between, uh, let me say, sufficiently close points. So if I have a long curve and I take, so if I have some curve gamma from, say, A, B into the manifold, if I break up the interval from A to B into sufficiently short pieces, each of these pieces should be the shortest <coughs> curve between its end points. Um, but you can see that they might, you might have, even though each locally you're moving efficiently globally, you might not be. Uh, right, so let me draw some familiar examples. Uh, so if we think about the sphere um, with its usual metric, so round sphere. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that the geodesics of the grid circles. Because uh, if you slice through this, so the, the intersection of the sphere or the plane through the center. <coughs> and if I have, it's fairly easy to make an argument that if I take two nearby points on the great circle, then any other curve joining them will have to be short, will have to be longer. But you can also see that if I have two points like that, if I go around the back of the sphere, that's the long way around. And it's not the curve of shortest length, but this one is. Anything up to two antipodal points is the shortest path. So then um, I could think about R this plane. Well, we're very used to, very familiar with straight lines. And then the plane has a convex quotient, which is the torus. So the most familiar torus is the one obtained by identifying opposite edges of a square, or more generally a rectangle, or still more generally a parallelogram. And if you, and the geodesics in the torus are still lines, well, with, uh, you have to, with suitable interpretation. So if you leave the edge of the, if you come to the edge of the torus, you reappear at the identified point, and you keep going in the same direction. So there is part of a line and a torus. And then the third sort of 
most familiar type of geometry is hyperbolic geometry. Uh, so there are a couple, well, there are quite a few pictures of ways to visualize the hyperbolic plane. Um, here are two of them. One of them is the Poincaré disk. <coughs> Uh, so this is the disk with unit radius. Um, if I have a vector, I don't, need, don't use the standard Euclidean length of the vector. I scale the length in the appropriate way. And uh, I think it'd be appropriate, so this is the disk of Euclidean radius 1. And I think the appropriate scaling is 2 over the radius is r, if you take 2 over 1 minus r squared times the Euclidean length of the vector. And that gives the hyperbolic medium. If I don't have exactly the right formula, it's something close to that. Um, and so you can see that as you approach the edge of this disk, the scaling factor blows up. And the distance from the middle, the hyperbolic distance from the middle to the edge is infinite. And then there's a second picture which is equivalent, um, and that is the upper half plane picture. So on the upper half plane, you have a vector v and Y is the Y coordinate in the usual coordinates. The hyperbolic length of V is 1 over Y times the Euclidean length of V. And the two pictures are the same. Um, there is a uh, fractional linear transformation, a Möbius transformation that takes the interior of this disk to the other half plane. And if you do the calculations, it carries the hyperbolic metric from this picture to the hyperbolic metric in the other picture. And there's a certain philosophy that conceptual pictures of the hyperbolic plane usually look nicer <coughs> in the Poincaré disk picture. But if you want to do calculations, it tends to be better to do them in the upper half plane. And there are quite a few other models of, of hyperbolic geometry that um, I won't mention at least not today. So, oh, and then uh, the point of drawing these pictures is that I can describe geodesics. So the geodesics are in the Poincaré disk, they are arcs of circles, and these circles are orthogonal to the boundary. See, because I put in the little things that say that they're orthogonal. Oh, and because the metric is just a rescaling at each point, um, angles in the hyperbolic geometry are the same as the angles in the Euclidean geometry. Um, the two metrics are concordal. So, and then the circle includes the special case of the circle of infinite radius. They're the geodesics that go through the centre of the picture. Um, and then in the upper half plane picture, the geodesics are semicircles that are perpendicular to the x axis. And again, there's the semicircle of infinite radius, or that's the vertical line. And So those are geodesics. Uh, you know, this picture maybe this picture appears to distinguish at the centre of the picture, but that's deceptive. Um, you can find a fractional linear transformation that you can move the centre to any other point, and there's an isometry. So the centre just happens to look nice in that model. But in fact, uh, this, the 
hyperbolic plane is completely homogeneous. Okay, so those are pictures of geodesics. And um, one basic property of geodesics is that if I start off with a point, well, if I start off with a point, that does not determine the geodesic because you can start in any direction because you could have the shortest path to any other nearby point. But if I pick a point and a direction to start in, then there is a unique geodesic that starts off tangent to that vector. And if you parameterize it with constant speed, then you get a geodesic uniquely determined by the initial vector. And so we tend to assume that the vectors have worked one. And so I think is it would be better to write down here or try to if I put this up. Uh, mm. Uh, so there's the, we have the geodesic flow. Um, so phi for flow, t for the amount of time. We can think of this either as on the entire unit tangent bundle, or we can think of it as usually we restrict it to the unit vectors. And the idea is we look at the vector v, gamma sub v is the geodesic with initial tangent vector v equals gamma v dot of zero equals v. And then um, you just wait for flow along, follow the geodesic for time t, and you get a tangent vector there. And this is what the geodesic flow does to the vector v. So you take a vector and you push it along the geodesic that the vector defines. Uh, so today I will not go through the arguments that say that um, this geodesic is well defined by the vector v. Uh, I think that's on the schedule for tomorrow. So, but it's reasonably believable. And it is true. So we have this geodesic flow. By, so essentially you're kind of, kind of thinking of all, ge, all of the possible geodesics all at once by thinking of the geodesic flow. And for each vector of the manifold you think of it as determining its geodesic and then sliding along the geodesic. Okay, so I've drawn the three examples that I chose were not random. <laughs> They were chosen to illustrate uh, different types of curvature. And for the sphere, the curvature is plus one. For the plane, the curvature is zero. And for the hyperbolic plane, the curvature is negative one. So today I won't say anything too technical about what curvature is and how you calculate it. Um, I'm planning to uh, give you some more details later in the week. Um, but so, I think for today, let me just give one interpretation of curvature. So, um, suppose we have a surface. Constant curvature. <coughs> so if the curvature is plus k squared, uh, but you, when all of my surfaces, what I want to do is to fix a point and then look at a circle around the point with radius r. So this is a geodesic circle. I follow geodesics that start at p radius r, and I want to look at the circumference of this circle. So, so the circumference of the circle of radius r around that point, I guess, is. So when the 
curvature is plus k squared. The circumference is 2 pi times the sine of k times the radius. Uh, the 2 pi comes just from the fact that we've got angle 2 pi. When we have 0, we get 2 pi times r. Uh -huh. A very familiar formula. And when the curvature is negative k squared, you get 2 pi times the hyperbolic sine of k times r. And you can see from these formulas that you get really very different behaviour for the, ge the geodesics of the three cases of positive, zero, and negative curvature uh, because the three functions behave differently. So sine, well, initially all the functions grow, uh, but sine, and the graph of sine looks like that. So geodesics, um, they start off growing like the derivative, but then they grow slow, and then they focus. And in the case of the Euclidean case, the distance between geodesics just grows linearly. And in the case of negative curvature, this is behaves essentially like <coughs> to the K R. And so you get exponential growth of this radius. So you get so here you get focusing. Here you get linear divergence. And in this case, you get exponential divergence. And it's this tendency of geodesics to diverge exponentially that is at the root of the behavior of geodesic flow and negative curvature. And it's the heart of hyperbolic dynamics. So, so the reason to focus on negative curvature is because of this behaviour and its various manifest um, consequences that come out of it. Okay, so um, there's a long history of thinking about geodesic flow for negative curvature, especially for surfaces. And the first paper in this direction <coughs> seems to be by Arnaud in oops, 1898. Uh, so he actually constructs models of actual surfaces with negative curvature. He, they're really, I think, embedded in R3. He talks about surfaces with their lines of curvature with opposed curvatures. And he already in this paper observes the exponential divergence and starts to draw some of the consequences of that. So it's an old subject. Um, and then there's a 19, and then there have been, after I don't know, many people thought about this. A partial list is um, Birkhoff, Morris. And the others. Um, there's a 1939 survey paper by Hedwig uh, Let me actually quote from it. Um, yeah. So in 1939, which is actually before the results that I really want to talk about this week, Hedlund already says, um, an enormous body of results has been attained, and an hour is entirely inadequate to permit a description of all. So,
Um, so um, I will use hip, head wound. I will quote head wound and um, not try to explain all of the results that have been attained by 1939. Um, but I will give a hint at what some of them were. So these were mainly results about about um, negative curvature. Well, some of Birkhoff's was, some of the studies were also about positive curvature. So actually, one result maybe I should mention uh, Birkhoff. Um, there's a beautiful argument by Birkhoff to show that if you have a metric on S2, uh, that there has to be a closed geodesic. Um, he sort of looks at a family of geodesics, or a family of curves, like that. These are all circles. And then he uses curve shortening process. So you systematically make all of these curves shorter. In Birkhoff's argument, he did it by um, breaking, by looking at points along the curve. If the curves are from, uh, from, if these are all maps of the standard circle into S2, he broke up the circle and went to be in equally spaced points for a suitably large E. Um, and then you, so you had along the curve, you had points, and then he joined the points by geodesics. And then it's a good idea to take the midpoints of those geodesic segments and join them. That two-stage process is helpful. Because uh, if you don't do the second stage, you might, if you start with the geodesic polygon, you'll get stuck. Um, and then there's a more modern way of doing curve shortening where you flow by the curvature of the curve, um, which is technically more involved. But if somebody has proved all the technical theorems for you, it then gives very nice results very quickly. Uh, but the idea is that you systematically shorten all of the curves. And uh, the curves, well, the two curves that are just points stay fixed. The very short curves near the points get shorter and shorter and collapse towards those points. Somewhere in the middle is going to be the, at each stage, is going to be the longest curve that's left. And you look at the sequence of longest curves, and the phrase that describes this argument is mean x. So at each stage, you look at the longest curve of a family, and the sequence of them has to converge to something, and they it can't collapse to length zero. So that's a very brief sketch of Birkhoff's argument which is really not in the direction of these lectures at all. But I think when I was a graduate student, I think that was one of the arguments that I learned that impressed me the most. Really made me think that, yeah, this is why I want to do mathematics. <laughs> so I can't resist mentioning it now. Um, but so the sort of results that I want to describe a little bit more systematically can all be thought of as some properties of the geodesic flow. Separating any two given points. Well, um, I'm not quite sure what I. You know, I don't think you'll get that. So I think if I start with. Um, but do they have to be a distance? No, I think if I start with my sphere, if I pick two fairly nearby points. Um, they need to be far. And what well, my family looks. 
something <laughs> like that. Um, well, so that I've drawn them. So I think what you get depends really on what the curves somewhere in the middle of the family look like. So I could um, start with, I could sort of cheat and start with a closed geodesic, which I know is going to be the answer at the end. And my two points might be over here, and my family could somehow, I can go out to that closed geodesic, and maybe, no, I'm not quite sure if I can achieve that picture, but I could certainly have this point more or less anywhere. I so I might be able to get that the curve separates the two of them. That's about as much as I could hope for. So there are more elaborate versions of this argument. Um, I think there are names like this to me. Schneelman and uh, I think Feet is another name from that group of people. And with considerably more care, you can find that there are three closed geodesics on any sphere, uh, which are short, they're pretty short, and they have no self-intersections. And you can't do better than three, because there are examples of the ellipsoid, where there are three ellipses, and everything else. Uh, I'm thinking of you may be able to arrange that everything else has sort of intersections. You know, certainly the three short ones in this picture are the three ellipses. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a significantly more difficult argument than the Birkhoff's argument. Um, and definitely keep going in a different direction from where I'm planning to go. Uh, so, yeah, so the what you end up with is, because you end up with just this sequence of curves that were the longest on each stage, and then they go, that all that you really know about them is that they don't shrink to zero. Mm -hmm. And I think they can... Self-intersections. Uh, like, well, if you do this argument properly, they don't. Because you start off with curves that don't self-intersect. And then you have to argue that your curve shortening process will not in introduce self intersections. And that is somewhat difficult. Um, I think for the traditional way of joining nearby points with chords, it takes quite a lot of thought. And I think there are disputes as to whether various written accounts of it actually prove that it doesn't happen. Um, and then the people who use the modern um, flow by the curvature of the curve method um, say that, you know, it's easy with, you use theorems about PDEs, and it just sort of appears. So if you buy into the PDE technology, I think it's fairly easy to not get self intersections. Okay, so that is a beautiful direction, but uh, so perhaps um, I could mention there is a problem related to this. So there are arguments of this nature that show that every compact Romanian manifold has at least one closed geodesic. I think in terms of theorems about the number of closed geodesics on compact Romanian manifolds. I think if you want a general statement that's true for, that's known to be true for all compact Romanian manifolds, I think at least one is the best that can be said, I think. The con it is conjectured, and the con I think the conjecture goes back maybe to Birkhoff, that there are infinitely many. Um, that has not been proven. Um, it's known that for generic, for many metrics that are generic in a suitable sense, there are infinitely many closed geodesics, but there is no proof for the general, possibly highly non-degenerate metric. Um, that's a 
if he calls. So he said, I'm certainly not talking about. So maybe I should try to get back to properties of the geodesic flow uh, for a compact surface with uh, the tap constant in curvature. So these are, if I make all of those assumptions, these are certainly all going to be results that were known by 1939 and are somewhere in here survey. I think most of them were also known then if you had just negative, but possibly variable negative curvature on the surface. And um, compact is not necessary for all of these results. Um, you have to have something in that direction. Because if you start with the hyperbolic plane, which has constant negative curvature, absolutely none of these results is true, as you'll see in a minute. So these are all properties of the geodesic flow. So the first one says that, um, I'll say that uh, closed orbits. Geodesic flow of the insulin tangent bundle. Oh, um, uh, before I talk about this, I should say something about surfaces with constant negative curvature. I've shown you the hyperbolic plane. Um, there are quotients of the hyperbolic plane which are analogous to the um, torus, which is a quotient of the regular plane. Um, so, compact, uh, this has to be oriented with surfaces with the genus uh, G. But two uh, can be realized as quotients of the hyperbolic plane. Um, so there's a fairly simple way to do it. You draw a picture of the hyperbolic plane, and I think I need uh, I need to draw a regular four G dot. So G is equal to two. I'm drawing an octagon. And if I draw a small octagon in the middle, uh, I should draw an octagon. It looks very, very much like a uh, Euclidean octagon. And you have equal angles, which are the same as they would be, well, very close to what they would be in the Euclidean case. And then you can make this larger and larger until it becomes an ideal optical. And as it becomes closer and closer to having its uh, vertices at infinity, the angles here approach zero. So somewhere in between there is an optical in which the interior angle is 2 pi over 4g. And the reason for that is that you can then glue all those angles together to get angle 2 pi. And there's a scheme for identifying the edges, which goes something like A, B, A, B, and then you do it again. And so if I have my octagon and I screw the edges together in this way, um, if you sort of remove a little bit around those vertices, you can sort of, if you deform the picture so it looks kind of like that, you've got one picture A, B, A, B, that looks very much like the torus, and then you've got a second copy. And 
So you end up with a tori, with the two tori, sort of group, the connected sum of the two tori, and you get a surface of genus two. Um, and if you do it with, uh, four, with a four G god, you get a surface of genus G. So that's one way of realizing the surface of genus G with the hyperbolic metric, as long as G is greater than or equal to two. And if you do the same construction for G equals one, you have to do it with the Euclidean plane, and you get the flat torus. Um, there are more, these are not the only, this construction by no means gives the only um, hyperbolic metric on the surface of genus G. There is a whole subject called the Teichenor theory. But this Teichenor space, which indexes all of the possible hyperbolic metrics on a given surface. Uh, and this turns out to be a um, complex manifold with. So it's an open subset of actually C to the appropriate dimension. Three dimensions. Three dimensions. Uh, thank you. Right. And then um, it could, if you had in, if instead of, if you also had some punctures on the surface, if you had in punctures, I would get to add in here. Uh, so I've just described one point in Pygmillus space. Now, so there are compact surfaces with constantly weak curvature. Um, so, yes, so then I claim that the closed orbits of the geodesic flow are dense in the unit tangent bundle. So, if I have my surface of genus 2, let's say, with a hyperbolic metric on it, what this is, means is that if I pick a point at a vector, as close to this vector, or as close to this point, and as close to that direction as I like, I could find something in an exciting and different colour. And this will be the orbit of this vector under the geodesic flow will be periodic. So the geodesic will do something. Um. Yeah, you know, it eventually comes back and closes up. And when I mean closes up, it doesn't come back like that. That's just a geodesic loop. It comes back tangent to itself and then it follows exactly the same path. So you get a closed geodesic. So any vector is close to any vector as you like, there's a closed geodesic going by. That's one of the theorems. Um, and uh, and so you can see that a theorem like this can only work if you have something in the direction of compactness. If you have the hyperbolic plane, there will simply no closed geodesics. Everything just goes off to infinity. So there has to be enough. There has to be enough um, I don't know, topology to allow things to come back. Uh, but um, if you had a quotient of finite volume, which would happen if you had some punctures on the surface, um, this theorem would still be true. And then another theorem is that um, there is a dense. So, in fact, if I start off with the same picture and I pick any vector v, I can find as close to v as I like. I can find a vector, say, w. In fact, not only is the orbit of w. Um, I could even say four orbit. So if I just follow V fours, it goes everywhere. And when I and I want to contrast this picture with what happens in the torus. 
a notorious IP, a geodesic that goes at an irrational angle. Uh, the geodesic will never close up, and you end up with that's a picture of a small part of the geodesic. The actual picture it's dense. But the picture that I'm drawing here is different from the one that happens here. These, these geodesics all go parallel to each other. If you look at the angle, it's always in exactly that direction. This orbit is not at all dense in the unit tangent bundle. So over here, it doesn't just come by closer to V again. It comes by, if I pick any vector I like over here, Eventually, this pink guy will come past almost in that direction, and almost in that direction. So the picture of the pink geodesic looks like that everywhere. So this is called transitivity. Uh, And there are some elaborations of this idea, uh, which I won't go into. I'll just describe one of them, because it's the most important one uh, that we think I can do. Um, so, result that I'm going to be talking about this week. So before I, I have to tell you what this means. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is to back up and explain a property of the geodesic flow. So there is a natural measure. is invariant under the geodesic flow. So what do I mean by a measure being invariant? I mean that if I pick some CX contained in a unit tangent bundle, um, well, a measurable subset. And then I look at uh, the measure of I think I look so phi minus T of X. So let's call this measure mu the measure. The measure of the inverse image of X is the same as the measure of X. Um, since my flow is invertible, um, I could actually just as well say that the, me that the measure of phi t of x is the same as the measure of x. But um, if you want to talk about, uh, if I have some space, uh, let me use, if I have some map, say, f from, and I want to talk, and I have a measure on E, and I want to talk about this measure being invariant. I, the, the good definition is that the measure of E inverse of X should be the same as the measure of X. Um, there are a couple of reasons why this is the right thing to say. And trying to say that the measure of f of x is the same of x is not the right thing to say. Well, there's one of those, there's just a general moral principle that 
what does it oh, of course this map is supposed to be measurable and that means that the inverse image of a measurable set is measurable being measurable does not say that f of x is measurable and it's not difficult to cook up examples of measurable functions and measurable sets <coughs> when f of the measurable set is not measurable so there are certain moral reasons to think that this is a good definition. There are also some pretty compelling examples that say this is the right way to think. So here's a very simple example. Uh, there's a map from S1 to S1. I'll call it D for doubling map. And uh, well, E to the 2 pi i theta becomes e to the 4 pi i theta. So what this means is you take the circle and you just double the length. It now goes around twice. And it's very clear that if I take a short interval, the image of it is twice as long. But if I take an interval and look at the inverse image of it. There are two inverse images. Um, yeah, no, the, this should be maybe there. There are two inverse images, perhaps there and there. Each inverse image is half as long. And you get this is measured precisely. And it's very, very clear that this is something that ought to if measure preserving is going to mean what you want it to mean, this ought to be an example of measure preserving. So this is the morally, this isn't just morally correct, it's the right, really the right thing to do. Okay, so we have a natural invariant measure. Um, and for today, I'm just going to say it's natural. Well, I can say a little bit more. We have, I described the Romanian metric on the surface. Um, you can say from the Romanian metric on the surface, you can even construct a Romanian metric on the tangent bundle. Then you can use that Romanian metric on the tangent bundle to define measures. The measures you get are these ones. That description um, does not explain why it should be invariant. Um, that's coming up in maybe tomorrow. Now, for today, there is a natural measure, it's, and it is invariant. Okay, so once you have a system um, with the preserved measure, you can ask the, for the property of being indivisible. So if I have um, some option, and I have, say, a flow from x to x that so preserves the measure of mu. I can ask, is this flow indivisible in some sense? It's easy to describe what divisible means. It would mean I can split into two halves, and each half would be and I haven't mentioned the measure yet, but the once you have a measure, um, if something has measure zero, it doesn't really count anything. So you would want to have that the measure of A is positive and the measure of B is positive. So now I've drawn a picture of your of a measure preserving flow and it's divided into two in a non-trivial way into two invariant pieces. And that is a picture of non-ergodicity. Ergodicity means that this picture does not happen. So Ergodicity means 
that I need your report. Invariant. Sub C. It has measure zero or its complement has measure zero. Out that the geodesic flow in the end curvature is ergodic in constant negative, well, in constant negative curvature. So that was known already um, by 1939. And um, Hedlund remarks in his survey that this result was not known, was not known in 1939 for a, for a surface of variable negative curvature. Actually, the lecture that the Paper was based on was given in 1938. So probably certainly in 1938 it was not known. In 1939, Eberhard Hoff proved it for a surface of variable negative curvature. Uh, so, you know, so that's the main result. And um, these results have been extended from surfaces of compact surfaces of constant negative curvature. So you need a compact manifolds of variable negative curvature in any dimension. And there are extensions beyond that. And with luck I will have time to say things about the extensions later in the week. Um, so what I want to do for the rest of the lecture is I first want to say a little bit about the main geometrical idea that goes into why these theorems are true. And then I will give um, I will give Hawke's argument in the simplest context in which you can do it. Um, but actually before I do that, um, let me just give a little sort of so this is the definition of ergodicity. Let me relate ergodicity to the transitivity that was somewhere on the board um, earlier. And it's, uh, oh, it's, it's up there. Ah, look, it's somewhere. Um, so there is a nice little argument. I suppose that the measure of mu, if mu um, is invariant, and uh, mu of m is positive for any non empty open set, then uh, Every V has V in one N has an N zero. Uh, so this is quite a simple agreement, uh, and it relates um, ergodicity to something maybe more geometrical. And the proof is really very simple. Uh, one n is a compact manifold. Um, its topology is uh, I can't I can't remember whether I'm supposed to say first countable or second countable. Maybe I'll avoid that issue and say there is a countable basis. One n two for the topology. So this means that every open set is a union of these guys. So every point, <coughs> if I have a point and an open set, there is one of these guys that contains the point and is inside the open set. 
So now let me define I look at what I call UI hanged, which is the set of uh, you write do it this way. It's the union over all T of what you get by flowing UI. Uh, this C is obviously invariant under the flow because it was I started with something I flowed it in all possible ways until the union. So it's invariant under the flow. And if I look at the measure of it, It's at least as big as the measure of what I started with, which is positive. Because I started with a non zero open set. Um, if, I, if I was stupid enough to include anything empty in my basis, I'll throw it out now. So we have this, and then by ergodicity, Uh, well, the measure of this invariant set is positive, so it's not zero. Uh, so the measure of the complement of ui hat is equal to zero. And then um, if you look at the measure of the tangent, if I take the union over all i of ui hat, the measure of the complement of that is also zero. So almost every vector is not in. Uh, sorry, almost every vector. Uh, I don't want the union, I want the intersection. intersection. Uh, I think. Um, but yeah, what I want, what I can conclude is that the union over I of the conclusion is supposed to be that the union of you, the intersection of the UI hats is equal to the measure of the whole space. So assuming it's ergodic, right? Yes. So the idea is that each of the so, um, well, so what I know is, I know that one of these, each one of these sets has full measure. So if I intersect two of them, um, the complement, um, if I intersect two of them, the complement of the union, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the complement of the intersection is, yes. is it, if I, even if I take the union of the complements, I still get measure zero. So I think, yeah. So I think I can say that the. So if I take the measure of the union over all i of the complements, that has measure zero. So that means that this intersection has full measure. So that means that almost every vector is in here. And so if V is in UI hat, that means that V T V is in UI for some T. So if V is in here, it's, there are times when V is in every UI, which means the orbit of V is dense. So this is a sort of completely general argument which says that if you're ergodic with respect to a measure that gives positive measure to open sets, then you get lots and lots of dense orbits. Almost every orbit is dense. Did, did you use compactness in 
Um, I think I probably used the, the measure, the total measure as final. Yeah, I think that's all I need. Um, that's why you've got that complement. Yeah, so I did decide at some point that I would tend to just assume that my surface or manifold is compact. Um, there will be some places where it will come to where things don't work, even for finite volume. And I don't want to get into trying to remember exactly what the maximum generality is. Um, yeah, but so certainly here, the, this is just an argument about finite volume and things like that. So now... Um, I, I just want to mention that the statement in the lemma, maybe you should include it. It's a Oh, uh, yes, um, Geometry that I want to describe, I want to draw a picture, some pictures of first cycles. So if I draw the upper half plane, I will draw the line at height, Euclidean height one. And then I will, that is a first cycle. Um, and the Poincare disk version of this picture, in that picture, um, <coughs> you do a Möbius transformation in which some point on the boundary corresponds to infinity up there. And this line becomes sort of like that. And then I have, if I pick a geodesic, well, in the point where I just picture, you can, if I have a geodesic, there's also another horror cycle that end. Uh, so in this picture, <coughs> that, that horror cycle would look like a circle there. So these are equivalent pictures. And I want to focus on this horror cycle. And I want to think of the unit vectors that point upwards. So in the picture, in the Quaker disk picture, they're the vectors that point inwards. So they're the ones that point in the same to the same side as the geodesic that I've started with. And now in the point array, in the upper half plane, I want to go up to this maybe is the point uh, zero one here. I want to go up to zero into the T. Uh, and then maybe I can have the point here, or I can have x, uh, yes, x1, up here I have x. And now I want to do some calculations of hyperbolic. Well, well so in the Euclidean picture, um, I have length x there, length x. Um, well, and the hyperbolic length, there is x times e to the minus 10. It's exponential shorter. And now what I want to do is to calculate the hyperbolic distance that we've gone up. So I just have to work out the length of that curve. And it will be the integral from uh, 0 to e to the t. Think of 1 to the t. Uh, one. This is one. Thank you. I, maybe I can think of this as zero. Okay. Yeah, that's where zero. That's how zero got into my mind. Of one over y dy. Because if I have the vector at height uh, y, 
the hyperbolic length of it is 1 over 1. So I have to do that in 2 form. And you get um, Ly from e to the t to e to the 0 e to the t. So in this picture, if you go up distance t in the hyperbolic geometry, the length of this arc shrinks by the fact that e to the minus t. So maybe I can maybe I can redraw my picture over here. I have my geodesic going along. I have my torus cycle, and I have the geodesic perpendicular torus cycles. This arc has gone from length uh, x to e to the minus t x. So you can see exponential convergence of things. So all I've shown is that the length of a certain curve shrinks exponentially. But it's not too difficult to believe that uh, if you look at the vectors that point vertically here and there, that the distance between the vectors has also shrunk exponentially. Um, the calculation that I've done here does not prove that. You, will, you also have to know something. You have to know that the distance between these, these vectors is sort of proportional to the length of this curve. And you've got proportionality there, and the, the, proportion, and the, the constant is the same in both cases. But, so those are some details that I'm skipping today. But you can see the exponential convergence very clearly. And um, that's the sort of uh, kind of the flip side of the exponential expansion that I described earlier. If you run exponential expansion backwards, you get exponential contraction. And so you have a picture like that. And so in the case, so if I look at this picture, I've got the inward pointing vectors. Their geodesics converge exponentially as you go forward. There's the other horse cycle. There I want to think of the vectors that point outwards, because the base geodesic that I began with points outwards. And then I follow all of these geodesics backwards. And you they approach each other exponentially as you go backwards. So that picture is the heart of sort of everything that that's all. So let me now try to prove the geodesicity of something. So the geodesic flow is a little more complicated uh, than what I'm going to do, mainly because there are three dimensions involved. Um, the unit tension bundle of the surface is three dimensional, and I want to cut down to two dimensions. So I want to think about this matrix. Um, it's not a, it's one of the simple matrices with all of the properties I want. You can see that it's in SL. So I think it's probably a bit easier actually in SL to Z. I think it would be enough. I think it would be okay if it's determinant, if I have one with determinant minus one as well. I think this matrix is also okay. If you square this matrix, I think you get that one. Uh, but what you, so what this mean, the fact that it so then it's invertible, and the inverse matrix also has integer entries. And so if you think about this matrix acting on the plane, uh, it preserves the integer lattice. So And it means 
means that you get a quotient action. So if I look at uh, if I look at a vector x y and apply this matrix to it, and then if I add integers um, and work out what I get, modulo one, this is going to be congruent to but to these populations. So you get a map A from T2 to T2. So well, obviously this matrix has been, was around for a long time, but I'm not quite sure when people first started thinking of this as a good example to think about. Um, these things are now known as a nozzle with the worthless of this. And this is the simplest example of one. So we have a map of the torts to itself. Well, actually, before I go to the torts, let me just say, if I think about this matrix, it has two eigenvalues. Uh, there's a real eigenvalue lambda that's bigger than one, and the other eigenvalue is necessarily one over lambda because the determinant is one. And because it's a symmetric matrix, the two eigendirections are equal. And it turns out that the eigendirection for lambda is somewhere in the first quadrant. The other one is perpendicular. And if you think about the map acting on R2, which is just like the lecture in the linear algebra course, you've got the eigendirections. This one gets multiplied by lambda. That one gets multiplied by one over lambda. Squares turn into rectangles, all that sort of thing. But on the plane, it's all very simple. This direction goes off to infinity. This one collapses in. But now you've got A acting on towards. So now this picture is supposed to be compatible with torus. It seems very strange. Uh, but what gets you out of trouble is the fact that the slope of this line is irrational. Uh, so if I draw the eigen direction in this picture, it never closes up. Obviously, if it did close up, something very bad would happen. Or if I ran the map of Bank, you know, this closed thing, it would be mapping into itself and getting longer. Yeah. So, so that, that really proves that this has to be irrational. And the other open direction is also irrational. So if you look at a rectangle in the torus whose direction, whose sides are chosen in the right way, as you apply a to it, it gets longer and longer in one direction, thinner and thinner in the other direction. So after a while, these are it all that looks pretty much like that. And it gets spread very uniformly around the towards. And so you can see that the behavior of this map is going to, be, it's going to take a small piece of the torus smear it around everywhere. Oh, and um, the fact that the determinant of A is equal to 1 shows that A is preserves area. So um, A is area preserved. And so what I'm going to show you is that A is equal But I can also show you that the periodic points for A at the ends. That's actually very easy. But actually, I think for both, so I'll show that as well as ergodicity. For both things, I can actually show two proofs. So, first of all, density of periodic points. Uh, well, there's a 
very easy proof. If I just look at uh, if I look at um, rational points of rational coordinates, it's easy to see that rational co point a, a point with rational coordinates with a denominator of e gets mapped to another point with the same properties. There are only finitely many of these points in the torus, so they have to be periodic. That's one proof. Um, if we describe a set of proof, which is not as easy, but it has the event, this proof totally relies on the fact that I have this, something like this. If I, the next proof applies not only to this, but to perturbations of this map. If I think about a point in the torus, oh, yeah, if I think about a point in the torus, say x, uh, well, just most points in the torus will eventually come back close to themselves. And if I start off with x, I've got through let me actually have it come back to a bit up there because it makes the picture easier to draw. Um, maybe I could use the pink chalk again. I have uh, the, I will call this the stable manifold for x. So this is in the direction, the eigen direction for the, the eigenvalue that's less than 1. This direction gets contracted. So by the time it's come back, it's short of okay. And if I pick sizes correctly, it's come back like that. And so if I now look at the unstable the projects along the unstable direction, this projects into the interior of what I started with. And then there will be some point Y. And t to the n y there, and it will project back exactly to itself. Uh, so the idea is I'm I'm starting from x that comes back close to itself, and what I want to do is to find something called find a point z that is close to x, where t to the n z. I should use A because I was using A. And um, by choosing Y, I'm halfway there. What I know is that sort of double, I know that um, A to the N Y is in W U of Y. And maybe I should also say for one bit. So I mean, if I follow this unstable direction, it, you know, it's all around the torus. What I mean is I then I only follow it locally and I get to A to the N Y. And now what I want to do is to so I, I now start draw the same picture again. But I start from Y and I've got somewhere T to the N Y. Uh, a equals T. Um, yeah, half the time when I was thinking about this, I had T for transformation. Yeah. And the other half of the time, I had A for a <laughs> um, uh, So now I think I want to look at the kind of unstable piece. And I want to go backwards from here to there. And the, the thing is going to contract to something like that. And then somewhere in here will be Z. And by, I think I forgot to mention the um, Brouwer Fittleton theorem. I use that to find y, and I'm using it again to find z. Uh, so what I have is z equals a to the max in z. There's my periodic point. So this is. This argument is roughly what is now known as the soft closing So the idea is 
if I have something that comes back close to, enough to itself after in the steps, then something nearby comes back exactly to itself after in the steps. And you can make this argument work when you have these stable and unstable manifolds. Um, and so I left out all the details, but that's the idea. Now I've left myself five minutes to do Hobbesarchy. So I may have to, uh, well, should I um, finish on time and put off Hobbes' argument toward the beginning next time? Uh, or would you rather I, uh, well, maybe I can give a brief sketch of it and say more next time. Yeah, yeah. That might be great. Yeah, sure, yeah. So, yeah, actually, what I will do now is show something that has the spirit thing in it, but is easier. So this is the uh, So I have my map A from T2 to T2. And so I think about a function E. C would do. Uh, and I want to show that. And so F is um, A invariant if uh, F of A is equal to F of X. Uh, so, for F X. so, and then the claim, what you want to show is that invariant functions are almost everywhere constant. So actually this should really be rather for all x for almost every x. Um, and then the if you think about the if you take f to be the characteristic function of a set that of a measurable set that's invariant, ergodicity me, means that this function should be the fact the set should be have a full measure or measure zero. So your characteristic function should be almost everywhere zero, or it should be almost everywhere one. So if you could prove that invariant functions are almost everywhere constant, that would prove ergodicity. And you might think that you've proven something stronger than ergodicity. In fact, you haven't. Um, if you start with, so it's clear that invariance, that, that it's clear that if if invariant functions are almost everywhere constant, then you have ergodicity. Uh, but the converse is also true. So if you start with, if you know that characteristic functions that are invariant have to be almost everywhere constant, you can then um, look at functions that are linear combinations of characteristic functions and do the usual measure theoretic kind of things and discover that you get all invariant functions. So actually let me show, so one, there is a way of proving that invariant functions are constant that's very special to the fact that we have something, we have a nice matrix. Um, so if I think about, if I write it in as a Fourier series, uh, so, and I write, I use e to the 2 pi i, uh, K so this is shorthand for so x is x1, x2. This is k1x1 plus k2x2. Uh, so then if of ax is everything is the same except that I have ax in there. And now a is a symmetric matrix, so A transpose is just the same as X, so this is the same as uh, E K K X. And 
now this is so if these things are going to be equal for almost all x, what you're going to discover is that ck has to be the same as cak, which is going to be the same as c a squared k, and so on and so on. And um, then you remember that if I have a reasonable function, that the Fourier coefficients have to die off. And you know, the sum of the squares of them is bounded. Well, here I've got infinitely many that are all the same. Okay, then they all have to be zero. So you discover that the only Fourier coefficient that cannot be zero is the one where k is zero, zero, which says that you've got a constant function. Okay, that argument is sort of it's very simple, it works here, but it's too special. Because if I were to take something, some sort of C1 perturbation, this, this argument is it doesn't get started. So let me now do a baby version of Hopf's argument. And I will assume that F is continuous. And what Hopf needs to do is to prove this where F is measured. But I'll assume that f is continuous. And then the argument is very simple. I have a point x. I have through x, I think I was drawing the sta stable guy in pink. Let's have a y. What happens if I follow the four orbits x and y? They stay in the same stable manifold and they get closer and closer to each other. So the distance from a to the kx to a to the ky converges to zero. And you know that f of a to the k y is equal to f of y. And I also assume that my um, invariance is just for almost every x. It's